I'll do the, the introduction of Mike first, even though I'll be talking first. Um, Mike McGovern uh, is quality manager at Innovise. He'll give a brief introduction of the company during the presentation. Uh, key highlight for Mike, at least in my opinion, uh, 25 years of quality experience in a variety of industries, which include the nuclear industry, electronics industry, and the medical field. Uh, so not just 25 years, but 25 years of pretty intense industries. Uh, myself, uh, my background, um, started using design experiments back in uh, 1986 at the General Motors Research Labs in Detroit, uh, using it upstream. Uh, since that time, worked multi-million dollar uh, new product developments with international teams uh, in a variety of industries, uh, primarily uh, med device and defense industry. Uh, 2006, I started my consulting business after teaching a bunch of years at St. Thomas uh, here in St. Paul. So I have a wide range of industry background uh, as far as working and consulting. Um, it's been 18 years now at St. Thomas, and 2006 is when I started my, my consulting work. Um, the other part of my introduction uh, is uh, just kind of personal goals, and sometimes people take these and they, they end up emailing on the other, other topics. I do a bit of basketball coaching. I'm actually an assistant high school varsity coach on the boys' side, and I've been passionate about that for a long time. So usually if you're talking about statistics or basketball, you get more post-talk feedback on basketball than you will in statistics. So just throw that out there if you, you have that. Talking with Mike earlier, and talk about, you know, I've, I've really had uh, three goals in my, my professional life, or you know, just generally in my life. I want to be a great uh, medical device consultant, I want to be a great basketball coach, and I want to be a great lover. Recently been having some troubles with the basketball team. So with, with that, to try and liven up uh, the presentation here, um, if you know where that quote comes from, let me know afterwards. Um, but that's, I stole that from someone else. Why move design experiments upstream? Um, traditionally, design experiments is understood to be a manufacturing type tool. Uh, and in my years, uh, starting at General Motors, um, we were using it upstream. We were doing it on manufacturing processes, but on things before they even existed in the plant or the, the vehicle it existed. I have my uh, phone number, uh, cell phone or mobile, and email uh, on here, mainly because if you want to interact, you know, whether it's basketball or whether it's this topic, you know, feel free to, to shoot an email or give a call. I, I just, it's a small world and it doesn't take much to, to help someone out, usually get them on the right track. So don't be afraid to do that for myself. I can't speak for Mike, but Mike's pretty friendly too. So what I want to talk about agenda-wise, talk about some of the I call common risk areas of any kind of new product development R&D work. What are some of the values and yet challenges of using design of experiments? Too many times um, people look at any kind of tool and that's all the advantages. They don't talk about the downside. I tend to over talk the downside. And I should say my background is mechanical engineering. Uh, so I'm not, I don't come up from a math and statistical point of view, not that I can't answer those questions, but usually only thing people care about is the value they can get from it. Uh, then Mike has a, a, a little segment uh, talking about just his experience. I obviously did some consulting work with Mike at Innovise. Instead of myself giving a case study, I wanted to invite uh, a company I've worked closely with, and Mike was the first company I talked to, and right away I'd love to help you out love to be there and tell the story of what happened. So I really don't know what he's going to say other than what happened. Um, but uh, anyway, it's kind of typical of what we've done. Then after Mike kind of talked about the case study, talking about how, how to gain the value for not just research and development, but OQ work. When I've seen design experiments being used, it's a lot in the PQ world, but not so much in that, that OQ world or upstream and certainly less so on the product development side, and that's where I've, that's where I've lived. And again, these, these risk impacts uh, to R&D, because um, I tend to do a bit of consulting right now in the, the risk management area uh, for companies to help set up the, the program management and, and uh, risk mitigation test strategies for new products. 
Obviously, if your R&D isn't going smooth, you're going to have huge potential for schedule delays, not just in your development uh, work, uh, but also in your production launch. Uh, I worked at Medtronic for a while uh, with a neural stimulator product, sold roughly on the market for about 40 grand. Anything I needed, anything anyone pushed me back on, I said, sell one more device. I need 40, you know, I need 20 grand or 10 grand. I didn't get much financial pushback because there's money to be made here. Let's just uh, let's just sell one more, and I, I can I can save some time. Uh, so that production launch is a big one. Those delays in development tend to be optimistic, and they pile up to the end of the product and the, our project. And that's one of the challenges that happens in R&D is not really seeing the real schedule. I forget which speaker it was, but talked about building your contingencies. Uh, you always got to have that potential for the iterations, depending upon the maturity of the product you're working on. But if you do push out in R&D, hopefully it's a good push out. Sometimes it's just we promised Wall Street; it's just got to get out there. Um, the opportunity for yield issues, and so you're struggling through production. I've been in environments where, not on projects I did, but I've seen other projects that were pushed out with a 30% production yield. Uh, if the, particularly if you're that low, what do you think you're going to have the opportunity for recalls and field issues? They go obviously hand in hand. Uh, so those are the things if R&D isn't going well. Schedule, money, production pain, and then bad, bad mark from FDA uh, as far as the recall and the, and the field. I put a little tagline at the bottom because this is what all those situations mean to me. Um, each one of those risk areas means there's inadequate understanding. Uh, one of the presenters again earlier today talked about um, if it's already been done before, you'd already be building it. So that research is going on and new products are being developed because you're trying to do something new that hasn't quite been done before. If 99% of it's been done before, then you don't have a whole lot of misunderstanding, that opportunity for growth. If it's a fairly new thing, uh, you're going to have some of those challenges uh, in, as far as the amount of understanding you have of your product. So the value of, of using DOE, uh, other than the, the obvious, gaining that understanding, which is the middle bullet, is to get to a cost-effective final solution. When I worked in defense, when I worked in medical device, uh, I was able to uh, achieve what I call development speed records at each organization, uh, which included two medical device companies as well as uh, my component of a billion dollar project for the Army, a 60 ton track vehicle. Um, you need to be cost effective um, to get to that final solution. That we think the next test is going to do it is, uh, is not always the way to go. Um, the efficient testing, you know, if it's cost effective but it takes a lot longer, that's not a good solution either. Again, we could sell one more peri if you get it done a little bit sooner. Uh, so really need to get that speed to market. And I found DOE can really get, it's an efficient way to get that learning quickly. It's not bogging down statistics and theory. It's really getting a, an efficient, quick answer and that, that final solution. And as the third bullet says, a clear cut understanding of your, of your system. Where that clear cut understanding comes into play, and this should have been another case today I could have added, but when I was at Medtronic, I mentioned doing neuro neurological stimulation, is deep brain stimulation for our device. And um, what should have been an 18 month project, we got done in 11, so there's kind of the speed record. But you know, if you get it done in 11 months and then you submit to FDA and they sit on it for 10 years, that really doesn't help. We got three week. FDA approval. I don't know how many of you do deep brain stimulation, but you would kind of hypothetically think that three weeks is kind of fast. If you know where, you know where companies are today for getting approval. That's what I mean by speed records. If you have that understanding, you can put that story together in a clear, concise way. You can get not just market quicker, but you're going to streamline that, that submission, that understanding. We got a page of questions back from FDA in that Medtronic case. We answered them all within 24 hours because we knew our situation. We knew our, knew our product and our process. DOE can actually, even though it's kind of a, um, a, a framework, a structured framework, it can improve creativity and innovation. I actually have a video out on YouTube talking about that particular topic. And it's well accepted by FDA, at least in the manufacturing world. Uh, anytime I've done it beyond that, it, it's certainly positive feedback as well. So you're not doing something that they haven't seen before.
Challenges with DOE, and I have two pages of these. Again, I'm you know one page of value and two pages of challenges. How to use the tools. Uh, and raise hands, it's the interactive part. How many of you love statistics? It's about what I figured, two out of 40. Um, that's about right. It's usually about one in 10. So how many really want to dig into that and understand that and then submit that, explain it to FDA or potentially a jury if things go bad? Um, I created a DOE process to address that issue. Uh, it was a presentation I did back in 2001 that's on my website if you're curious, some of that background. Uh, but usually it's the tools and stats that are taught, not a process on how to apply it. Understanding the statistics, we already got the two and 40 that like math or statistics. Um, and I know Jason's a math major, so he was a given. Um, but the key tools of DOE really are easy to understand. Uh, it doesn't have to be complex. You can make it complex, but the core to it is actually pretty, pretty simple. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about something called effective sample size. That's another case where I have uh, any of the asterisks. I have YouTube videos out there on a Perry Solutions uh, channel on YouTube to help explain those. They're two or three minute things to get you at least a little bit deeper flavor. So if you're curious about those. But it has a huge, the efficiency comes from this uh, effective sample size uh, topic. Appropriate scoping of the, the project. I was talking to someone during a break about DOE. If you're in manufacturing, you're not shipping, or you know, your yields are 30%, they used to be 90%, pretty clear what the objective of your DOE test should be. But if you're in product development, how do you scope that right? You could test everything, and so everyone tends to design the one test that'll solve the world. Uh, and generally speaking, smaller tends to be better. And I have uh, some scoping videos out on YouTube as well. I actually have 45 videos out there, different topics. Using every combination of your variable levels certainly can be overkill. That's very inefficient. Some with limited DOE training tend to do that and then not have results from it. I won't give you the case studies for that, but the initials of the company or the US Army uh, have done that before. Um, and on the order of $600,000 tests that they never claimed existed. But that, we're not talking about that. Um, second bullet, uh, potential for what they call aliasing. Uh, the important process uh, contributors. If you downscope it too much uh, and oversimplify it too far, you can lose some of the important data. Now, how do you find that right balance of not being too big and every combination inefficient and yet not so small to lose some of that, that resolution of what's going on? Um, and this is one, if you, you kind of learn some of the basics of DOE, um, or some of the uh, tools make a linear assumption. Uh, and how many, again, similar raise of hands, how many of you work on purely linear systems? But well, that's even less hands than who likes statistics. So, um, sounds like a horrible assumption. And actually there's a lot of stuff in standard linear models if you do the analysis a certain way. Um, and I actually disclose that on YouTube too, what that is. Uh, but there's ways to check that nonlinear assumption, uh, even though it's a linear thing. Uh, it's, it's not that magical to do it. So those are some of the challenges. There's huge values, but there's some things to overcome. Things to overcome really aren't that hard, but if you didn't hit one of those, uh, I'd be shocked, because those are normal things that people uh, kind of complain about. This is where Mike's going to jump up and talk about our experience working together. All right, who's ready for some margaritas? <laughs> One person, okay. <laughs> Four people like statistics. So, again, my name is Mike McGovern. I'm the quality manager at Innovise. And um, just a, a quick, brief introduction of who we are and what we do. Uh, Innovise was founded in 1958 by uh, a gentleman, and he built that company on uh, printing, screen printing to be exact laminating and die cutting. He's provided a lot of labels to the electronic industry for uh, equipment um, overfaces, nameplates and things like that. And um, through the years, Innovise continued to add uh, capabilities to the point where now we're 98, 95 to 98% medical products. Um, it's still 
privately held company, and the son's uh, the found the son of the founder is uh, a couple of doors down from me. Some of our capabilities include uh, converting, die cutting. Uh, we're really good at taking a lot of different materials, bringing them together, and die cutting them into uh, uh, different shapes and devices. Laser cutting ability, packaging. We've uh, just we have two clean rooms. One is certified at uh, class 100,000. The other one is certified at for 10,000. So we're we're hope, we're headquartered in. Uh, St. Paul, actually, Vadness Heights, and we have sales offices in Alabama, California, and of course here in Minnesota. We're ISO 9001, 2008, uh, 13485, and uh, registered with the FDA. So I want to talk about two aspects that, that Perry helped us with, and one was in a reactive situation and the other one was in a proactive situation. So the first project, we were in a bit of hot water. Um, we had an issue where one of our customers that was you know, a, a Fortune 500 company um, was seeing a problem and we needed to come up with a, an answer relatively quickly or we could impact the international supply chain. So Perry was actually brought in as a statistical analyst and you know I was thinking you know when, when you're going to present data to a, a group you need to address your audience. So I was thinking well how can I really say what Perry did for us? And so my, my first thing was saying, well, there's, there's probably a lot of engineers in here, and engineers are going to really want to see a lot of statistical data. And um, so I started putting that together. And then I thought, well, engineers, too, they, they like to know about materials and things. So I started gathering information on uh, uh, surface geometry and flow and viscosity of the adhesives. And then I, I thought, well, there's going to be managers in here, and managers want to know about the bottom line and on-time delivery. And so I was putting that information together. And then I thought, well, there might be PhDs and doctors in here, and I don't know what they, they want to see. But my daughter was over looking my shoulder, and she says, well, what are you doing? And I was kind of telling her, and, and she goes, boring, boring, boring. And, and she goes, I can make that. Uh, presentation for you exciting and, and something everybody would like and I go well great what's that she goes pictures of kittens everybody likes pictures of kittens <laughs> and so I thought I thought that was that was really great but bottom line was Perry came in and we were struggling with this for some time actually uh, our customer had sent in a expert black belt to help us and we were gathering all kinds of information and and what kind of just registered with me when Perry was talking up here a minute ago when he was talking about every combination is kind of an overkill and I think that that's where we were at with this problem we were really kind of gathering too much data we didn't know where to focus and we were actually kind of you know hindering our, ourselves so when Perry came in he really um, re helped us redefine the problem, I guess. And, and he came up with a design of experiments that we executed and came up with an economical solution for us. And in his terms, if, if you spend any time with Perry at all, it's really about achieving that sweet spot. And we found that sweet spot. And so we were able to fix the problem get back up in production in a relatively short amount of time and ship product and for two years now we have not had any issues with this device and so it was a great experience. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, a proactive approach that we brought Perry into 
and we had a customer that we're making a wound care product for and they wanted an economical packaging um, solution and what they thought would work is a economical paper paper um, package that would go through a heat sealing machine and uh, we, were, we wanted to gain a high degree of confidence before we went into the validation. So Perry came in and he set up a, a four point uh, validation, or not validation, but the DOE went through that. A lot of questions came out of that. Uh, one thing with Perry too is you'll get a lot of questions. And they're questions that, you know, once you ask them seem really simple, but they never seem to be questions that are asked when when you're sitting around with the with the team. And so out of that came came some more questions and then finally set up a, a three factor DOE out of that. And what came out of that was we found you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And you know, so we really weren't able to achieve the result that the customer had wanted. And uh, you know, why, why this is really somewhat disappointing, it, it saved us a huge amount of time and effort and frustration if we would have went up on press and tried to validate this prior to the DOE. So, um, you know, we've talked about the benefits of, of DOE upstream and, and a, a lot of things, but for me, the key takeaway is, you know, you can spend a lot of time trying to, well, let, let, let me back up a second. You know, you can immediately go up on press and try to push something through without um, really doing your due diligence. And then you end up with a problem, and then you bring in the engineers, and they, you know, you end up doing a DOE. But if you really do that ahead of time, you can save yourself a lot of money and frustration, and you'll really be able to um, uh, sleep better at night. And so there's there's my picture of uh, our little pussy cat. <laughs> so thank you very much. And Mike's phrasing to me was, doing it upstream allows you to sleep better at night. When I love Mike's phrasing, because Mike always phrases things very, very smoothly. Uh, yeah, hot water with the Fortune 500 customers shutting down their international supply chain. Uh, yeah, that's, that's hot water. And again, I, some of the times when I come in and, and look at a company, as Mike said, I try and ask a lot of questions, try and make sure I'm not just jumping to conclusions. And I would say about half the times I come into companies, unless I've trained the people there, uh, about half the time I'll say, you're not ready for a DOE anyway. Do this, this, and that first. Because these may be quick answers. And if they're not quick ones, because I want you to have a good solution, if we can't find it quick, then we're going to have to do something a little bit more, a uh, little bit more in depth. I have a couple slides here uh, highlighting what I consider key activities in both R&D and OQ. And then the keys to achieving uh, these values within these activities. And obviously these are all activities I think DOE uh, supports. Creating tolerance limits for acceptable performance. So this is again at the product level. Where, where, are, those, where are those limits? And is it valid over a range of uh, you know, use conditions, temperatures, humidities, and otherwise? The term robust design gets used a bit, but that's kind of the idea there. And, and I guess the second bullet, similar thing, understand the environmental sensitivities of those tolerances and what it does to your product performance. Uh, determine the use conditions. Uh, what if it's used different than you, you, you uh, anticipate? Uh, can, can you put those, those use situations during startup mode maybe or shutdown mode? Uh, different material options, as Mike was talking about in particular. Um, they were trying to find this paper-on-paper -paper solution because it was the most inexpensive material. So 
instead of going to production, and you don't have to raise hands on this one, but how many of you have been in situations, or at least hypothetically have been there, where management would have said, but this is an important customer, we just gotta push forward, we'll figure it out later. We'll make it up in volume, right? Well, if you're losing money at small volume, you lose money faster at large volume. Um, we understood the material options. We said, this one's not capable, but if you do this to the material cost, then it'll be cost effective. They said, well, then it blows our market price. Well, then it, it won't work. You know, it's not a fun answer, but it's better than losing money forever. And I, I've worked at those companies for sure in the past. And then determine the critical components. Which ones do you really need to audit at the vendor and have a whole lot of incoming inspection on? Or which components really aren't that essential from a process capability or otherwise? If you don't know which ones are critical, you treat them all the same. If you can design them to be non-critical components, which I did at another uh, company here locally, you could take things that were critical components, design out the criticality of it, uh, and then reduce your inspection. And it made a fact inspection and scrap. Key OQ activities. Your process control limits, I put in kind of the standard uh, ones from Mike's area there, but you can think of your own. Uh, software parameters and validation uh, you know, of your software. I've done a bit in the software world as well, even as a mechanical guy. Uh, process operating procedures, what is the sequence of events that you go through or cleanings that you go through? Material handling, how does that affect um, things? Short-term stability and capability of your process to get some early indications of that, then optimize that. And that's kind of the big thing we were doing with Mike was uh, understanding that process capability at the development level versus a PQ level. And then if you look at it again, some of the talks today, I think several of them talk about FMEA, um, failure modes and effects analysis. If you look at your potential failure modes, uh, the biggest risks you have really are lack of understanding. If you can gain that understanding, the only way I've found to do it is through DOE, to be effective. If you have some great ideas, chase the ideas, don't do a DOE. If you have a brilliant idea, but if that brilliant idea isn't working the way you thought it should, empirically getting that through DOE uh, truly helps. And as Mike, Mike talked about me using the term sweet spot, uh, this is my very first DOE since July 18th, 1986. I would have had it in color, but we didn't have colored printers back then. Um, so he, I call it the Morse code output lines. I'm going to step to the screen here and talk about it. I'm a basketball coach. I've yelled at many kids in the gym at the same time, kept them in control, so I think I can do it here too. Depending on where you consider a sweet spot, you have the scale down below for appearance of the, the, the paint, so it's General Motors. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the Buick Riata, it was a two-seater sports car Buick put out about this time. This is when, this is prior to the plant being refurbished for this vehicle. We were optimizing the paint system in the lab. So this is just visual appearance rated by a bunch of the <laughs> R&D folks, including myself. Uh, we had a fan pressure, fluid delivery rate. There's other variables, but that's the ones we could grab. You can see the concentric circles here. Imagine this was your sweet spot for your process. That was the acceptable appearance. Where's your manufacturing specs? Looks like about 32 to 34 on the fan air, and fluid delivery, 27 to 28. You got your spec window and you know why. That's what I mean by understanding. If this circle, though, was the acceptable appearance, you got a much bigger process window and you can see what, what changes with those numbers for that. And those were equal increments of appearance change compared to the ones down here. So you depend upon where your threshold is, your requirements, your acceptable performance, you can define your process window. Of course, the other thing we had was thickness of paint. So we just overlay these graphs on top of each other. Where did we get the thickness we need and the appearance we need? There's our process window. Having experienced, well, obviously R&D since the mid-80s, I've never seen R&D people without DOE, they could run a validation test that performed better than their previous R&D work. What we did, we came into this sweet spot, we ran what we call confirmation paint panels. Every, pa every confirmation panel was better than our best DOE run. So you gain understanding, you can predict something better. And that's the type of experience that we had with Mike as well, finding that sweet spot. I didn't always show the fancy graphs, uh, but we got to that same end point.
So some keys to having success in the upstream. Um, keep the DOE small. Um, I didn't mention this one yet, but when I was in the defense industry, I, I created a, a DOE for a war game to justify our 60-ton track vehicle for the Army. Uh, Congress and different generals were reviewing our results, and Pentagon were reviewing the results of that DOE on the war game. That's not necessarily a small DOE. Um, people are trying to solve all the world's problems almost like that in every DOE they did. Keep them small, to me, usually small means three to seven input variables, at most nine. The war game was nine input variables. That sounds weird at a war game level, how can you only have nine? We found a way to simplify things to reduce the complexity of the test. Consider phase testing. Don't try and solve all the world's problems in one test. Uh, the way that war game worked, there are certain buckets of things that we grouped together. If that bucket was important, then it break down into these four or five or six things. We had a really strategy on how we were gonna, gonna do it. I do that with a lot of my testing, particularly when I get called in. It's not uncommon to have a two or three phase test plan. And then phase two and three get a little bit gray as far as what they're going to be. It's based on the learning that you get. Um, start simple. A lot of people figure, well, I don't have a nonlinear system, so I'm going to use three or four levels for everything, temperatures and pressures. Um, I, I tell you, start with two conditions. Even if you're wrong, we can figure it out enough because it's going to tend to be iterative and there's going to be, tend to be phases. So anticipate that. Keep it simple first. And even if you do think you need it, you may still need it, but you learn enough where you, it, the approximation is close enough. And even though I say keep the DOE small, uh, the fourth bullet down says consider more variables. Don't narrow down too quickly. Uh, I recently was working with an organization, been working 21 months on a root cause without me involved. Let me emphasize that. 21 months without me being involved. And of course, what's their answer today? Well, I'm pretty sure it's this one thing, or these two things. I promise you, if it's been going on 21 months, it's not just two things. So open it up, at least be three. If I get called in, it's at least three things. If you run a DOE, it's probably at least three things, at least first phase. You may test five things and say these two are the essential ones, then phase two can go down to two. I've done that, but I rarely will start a DOE with two, two input variables. It's not efficient anyway. If you understood the math, you'd realize the third variable's free. So why is, you might as well start with the third. Um, focus on the inc incremental learning. Um, the last bullet, don't depend upon mimicking past test, test methods. I see this a lot in medical device. Um, FDA accepted this testing before, so we're just gonna test that way again. If your product matured or your competitors matured, the FDA's expectations don't stay stagnant. I think you guys have all realized that. Uh, they tend to grow as the product grows. Uh, so you need to really think about how those expectations may be raised. I'm not saying every time you test, use a DOE. Uh, one of the first consultants I tried to bring in for, to help me with a project, uh, that's what they were saying all the time. Anytime you test, it has to be a DOE. And I think that's, that's horribly wrong. And a second page of, of keys to success. Don't wait to design the perfect DOE. A lot of people in R&D kind of have that attitude. Well, I don't know this yet, or I don't know that yet. Once I do, then I'll design the DOE and we'll run it. If you could divide, design the perfect DOE, you, you don't need one. It's gonna screw up, figure out quickly what that, how it's gonna screw up. There's still time for playing around. I think Mike, if you chat with Mike, who I was supposed to mention this before, but as soon as we're done here, where we had lunch today, it's gonna be a little drink social. So I don't know if Mike's going to that, I'll probably be at it for a little while. I think Michael confirmed this. There's still time for playing around. I'm not a pure structured theoretical that everything's got to be in a DOE matrix. You know what, go play with this for a while. And our eventual solution came out of, you know, I know I wasn't supposed to do this, but because we were efficient with the DOE, I had some extra time at the end of the shift. The operator was going to stand around because they couldn't start up a new job. So I played with this. It seems like it has promise. Can we include that in the next DOE? Thank you. You know, thanks for being a little bit creative. It allowed the time for that plan around. Um, oh, to me, PQ is testing for the record. That's what you're going to show to the FDA. OQ isn't about passing or failing. It's about learning. So take the pressure off about what you're doing there and constraining it. Open it up. Test early and often. We've heard that today. Uh, used, I've also used DOE in certain cases for test method development. Uh, the gauge R&R might not be enough to really develop a good, uh, reliable measurement system. 
if you're breaking the leading edge into new therapies or new types of products. Uh, perform good statistical analysis, including residuals. That's the secret of finding those nonlinearities in a linear model, uh, is in that residual analysis. If you don't know what that means, like I said, there's a YouTube video uh, that talks briefly about that. So in conclusion, the benefits of using DOE upstream are actually well established. They've been used, I've been using them for over 25 years uh, in an upstream type environment, not just root cause, not root cause. Manufacturing, troubleshooting, problem solving on the production floor, doing it early and preventative uh, is well established and is well accepted by FDA. And I guess that's the second bullet. Even though it's not a direct FDA expectation to use it upstream, um, our experience has been that it's clearly accepted in both R&D and in OQ situations. If you want to see any of the reference material, I got a lot of content out of my website, the publication section, in addition to sending out a quarterly newsletter. If you want that, if you want these slides, give me your card, I'll, I'll, I'll send it out to you. Um, but there's a lot of stuff I put out on YouTube and, and on the publications page. Questions, thoughts? Being the chair for the session, I had to keep myself on time, so we're five minutes early. Otherwise, there'd be severe penalties. Thanks for your attention. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed the, the session. I don't know if you're in here all day. I recognize enough faces that I think most of you were. Um, if you want to say hi after, certainly do that. Otherwise, appreciate your attention and maybe catch you in the, I'll call the lunchroom, but you know what's going to go on in there. Thanks. <laughs>